Hello and welcome to ET India Inc. Boardroom. We have a panel on which we would be discussing how India can become more equal country. And we have on this panel, Dr. Arvind Virmani. He is a former chief economic advisor to the government of India, and he is now the president of the Ego Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, we've just seen your report and uh, I mean, the paper which came out. And I want to begin by asking you on the, uh, you know, estimates you have used extrapolation from the consumption survey. Now, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, reports and estimates that we have got, uh, which say, you know, poverty was in fact uh, higher. So, uh, you know, what, what do you have to say about this? You know, how do you sort of uh, justify the numbers? Uh, I mean, the oh. extrapolation bit that has been done in your study. So one uh, is your broader question and then the details. So the yeah. broader question is how is uh, poverty uh, measured? Well, there is a standard methodology which has two parts. One is that uh, the first preference is if there is a proper survey conducted in the same way at, as it has been previously conducted and they are well-defined methods of doing it. Uh, India was uh, one of the first, US and, and India were the two countries which started surveys, consumption income surveys, the first in the world. So that is all standard, that is the preferred method. Generally, surveys are done one to six, uh, uh, sorry, uh, five to six years apart. The second part of it is when, uh, for periods when the survey is not available, given that it is so infrequent across the world, uh, there is a again a standardized uh, projection methodology. The details we will get into in the second part of the specific uh, study paper or analysis. So uh, uh, that is based on the last available survey being projected forward in various ways. Okay, there is a standard World Bank method. Uh, in our paper, we uh, use both that method and. Uh, for reasons which we can discuss and which are all given in the paper. We've also given the results for what we think is our preferred method along with uh, the standard World Bank and other methods. So that is the overall picture. Now we can get into the details as you know. So basically during the pandemic, uh, you know, most estimates, most papers have, uh, you know, they have said that you know, poverty is going Right. So uh, during the pandemic, the first thing to note is uh, that what kind of survey. So the survey we have used for projections is 2011-12, which is a DTS survey. People who don't know about survey, they are like a hundred questions. Okay. There could be 30 questions on food itself. Okay, sure. These are all detailed, noted questions. So there's a big amount of detail in each of these surveys. And uh, what the uh, people who are talking about in the pandemic, there is no such survey in the world as far as I know during the pandemic. So you could ask, what are they doing? Okay. Well, some of the ones which I uh, read were talking about telephone surveys during the pandemic. There was no way of going out there and meeting people. It's a completely different thing. We have no idea what the methodology is. We have no idea how comparable it is. So first essence of if you want to do a time trend, you must have a comparable survey. To my knowledge, there is no comparable survey compared to any standard survey. I'm not talking only about India. Yes, definitely about India. But if you take any other country, uh, the best surveying countries in the world. So. Uh, so definitions, etc. If you get to individual thing, I can reel off a whole bunch of things uh, which are different. Uh, let me just start by giving you a little picture of what. Uh, so one of the important uh, things we have done is we, which is our criticism of the World Bank, is that they use called what is called the unit recall method. In the 2011-12 poverty calculations. Uh, we switched over before that actually, uh, well before that, we uh, introduced something called a mixed recall period. Now it turns out that I was there even before this method was introduced and I had argued strongly. Uh, and again, depending on time, we can go into the details of why this mixed recall period was better, but this was done between 2004 and 2011. The 2004 
poverty calculations were done under my uh, while I was in charge of that particular division. So again, we can discuss how that was done. Uh, in, in 2004, which is generally two years later. So 2004 would mean in five or six, uh, this calculation was done uh, in the PPD division, which I headed at that time. So, uh, so the first uh, way we differ, though we give the uniform recall method and the mixed recall uh, exactly for the reason, it gives us approximately 10% lower poverty number. So that is one thing with respect to uh, the standard World Bank methodology. Second uh, way in which we differ, and again, we give two sets of results, is that we use both uh, the national accounts. And again, if you have any doubts on that, please ask the questions, uh, because some people have raised yeah, yeah. they don't understand what we have done. Okay? So if you have any doubts, please ask them. And the second is we, for the uh, as, again, as far as I know, we've gone down uh, for this projection method, we have gone down into the states and looked at the in detail the the STP numbers which were available and use those uh, nominal STP growth rates also. So both these uh, kind of calculations we have given. So four uh, many different calculations, but these four uh, we have given in our thing. And our preferred one uh, is the PFCE with the mixed recall method, which is what we have been discussing. Uh, digging forward, uh, you know, what you've said. So you the paper also sort of uh, alludes to, you know, reduction in inequality. Uh, essentially, but what we've seen is that, you know, uh, the upper income group during the pandemic uh, last two years, uh, they were the least hit and inequality, in fact, increased uh, anecdotally also, and there have been multiple reports also. So, uh, uh, you know, why is there this divergence uh, in what we've been sort of seeing and the paper? So again, it's very important uh, to go into the details. So let me first talk about uh, our calculation for inequality. So uh, in the World Bank method, uh, they they apply whatever the growth rate, uh, you know, they apply the same growth rate across all individuals, okay? What we have done is we have applied CPI numbers, not the national accounts deflator, the CPI deflator, by, the CPI by urban, rural, and across, you know, 20, whatever, uh, nine states and UTs which are there. So uh, in the conventional World Bank method, there will be no change in distribution because they would use the 2011-12 distribution and project it forward and calculate the new poverty numbers, okay? Because the same growth is applied. What we do is we calculate a different real growth rate applying CPI numbers. So our distribution actually changes. So that's another thing to note. This is very unique. This has, uh, again, not been done very often, okay? Because uh, given our federal structure, we have 29 states. You know, if it's a unified country, it doesn't make any difference, but we are getting different real growth rates implicitly, you know, the exact detail, you don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but uh, so effectively we are able to get a, a, a change in the distribution. So what does that show, okay? So, and, and why, why is it different from, uh, from, from other uh, estimate you have seen. So let me get the table. Uh, sorry, I got it somewhere here. <laughs> so, uh, okay, here we are. So what we show is that uh, the distribution from in 2004, the number was 31.3. It was more or less the same 31.3 in 2011. So no change in the inequality as measured by the genie. In 2019, it was a little higher, 31.4. We don't say that it has gone down in, by 2019. In 2020, it's even a little higher than that, 31.5. If you just go by the standard methodology, what we have shown is that when you account for in-kind kind, kind transfers, this changes radically. So that's the second or third or fourth, I don't know. Uh, which big result of ours that in-kind transfers 
in a situation where the GDP declines by 6.6%, in normal conditions, there may have been not so much an effect. In these conditions, there was a substantial improvement in the Gini coefficients, one percent point, because the base Gini did not change much. I just gave you the numbers. It only changes in the first decimal. But when you take account of the food expenditures, the free food plus the subsidized food was given, then the inequality changes in the pandemic period. That's if you're only interested in the pandemic. That is what the results show for the pandemic period. I should just add, by the way, and again, I won't go into the detail. I'll leave it on the table if you want to ask more. I have done a simple calculation for inequality from the rural wages survey, which is again a standard survey. And I can talk about that, what that shows. Sure, sir. So I'll just come to uh, that uh, in a bit, uh, but I just want to, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned how, you know, the food transfers uh, really sort of changed the whole uh, situation. Uh, so they did impact, they did bring about a reduction in overall poverty. Now, what I want to ask you is, uh, you know, are these the most effective and uh, are these sustainable, uh, these measures, you know, given that, you know, the government has fiscal constraints? Right. So uh, first your direct question, but just on the side, I want to mention that people have, uh, that, that we are talking about absolute poverty right now. We are talking about absolute poverty. There's also lower middle income poverty and upper middle income, which we have not addressed because we're not relevant at this point, which is 5.5. We have not talked about that. Keep on doing. Again, some people seem to be all confused about this. So it's very important. So, so what the, uh, just the results first, what it shows is that food transfers uh, reduce, uh, uh, offset the decline in poverty, which did happen and offset it. So we came out more or less even on, absolute poverty, but was still lower on the other poverty we have calculated. So it's all transparent. There's no nothing hidden. Some people have attributed motives to us. In fact, one politician has called us a liar. I mean, very strange. Okay, he clearly doesn't understand the paper. So uh, so 3.2 poverty, the numbers are there. It, it, it offset about 20%, if I remember correctly, but it's the, that poverty increased during the pandemic. So nobody's saying here that you know, that pandemic wasn't a big uh, problem. Now, uh, uh, food transfers. So uh, what should they be continued? I, I think that's your, your question here. So yeah, basically, you know, uh, these we've seen how they impacted, you know, we've right. seen uh, uh, actual, uh, you know, in, in reality, how they impacted. So are these the most effective yeah. and are they and are they sustainable? You know, because the Absolutely. has a large fiscal deficit. Yeah. So here is my position. My authors may differ a little bit, uh, co-authors. So I'm speaking for myself here, but, but more or less in agreement. So my view is that uh, we were, uh, you know, in, lucky that in 2013-14 the Food Security Act was passed, and which was more or less in place by 2014, and then the uh, Aadhaar and other efficiency measures have made this very effective by the time the pandemic occurred. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so in 20, uh, uh, in the Food Security Act, uh, it already was giving 50% of urban population and three fourths of rural population subsidized food. So during the pandemic, what the government did was to add another five kilograms, which was completely free, okay, no charge. So uh, what, uh, and one of the reasons, important reasons which uh, uh, for doing it is because we have huge accumulated stocks of wheat. So clearly in that kind of situation, it was a bold and correct move uh, in my view in hindsight. Uh, frankly, I can admit, I, I think in one of the programs you were there, I was talking about uh, cash transfer and, and mobile payments. Why? If you remember, because there was all this problem about migrants. And I was saying, if we had a cash transfer system based on mobiles, they would have been able to get whatever subsidy wanted to give them right away, whether half the families in urban area, rural area, whether they are traveling, et cetera. I still believe that is the correct long-term approach. But uh, first acknowledging that in the current situation, it was necessary. Uh, perhaps government has, and it was going to end in March. 
uh, government has decided to uh, take it uh, to uh, extend it to September, I think it makes some uh, argument is there because even though the economy is now back to around two to three percent above the 2019-20 level, there may be pockets of people who are still kind of you know who suffered from pandemic yes, and yeah, back on their feet. So okay, yeah. but I do not believe it should be extended beyond September. And really, the long-term solution still remains, in my view, a cash transfer system. And I have made many proposals about that. We can go into details about it. Uh, which uh, I think uh, pandemic was an unprecedented where you know absolutely. because it's a once in a century, century situation which is very very yeah. unlikely to occur again. So in my view, actually, even the Food Security Act should, over the next few years, when we switch over to this other definition of poverty, maybe reduce. Uh, the eligibility further and focus resources on the cash transfer system. Also, since you've talked about, you know, the definition of poverty, uh, you know, changing the criteria, you know, from 3.2. Uh, so, you know, what kind of policy implications, uh, you know, does that uh, sort of hold? So, uh, you know, what are these, indi the, the poverty indicator, what does it tell you? One is it's a summary measure of uh, marking progress okay so given that in our view uh, we are virtually at zero uh, in 1.9 or absolute poverty by the way again just an aside some people think we are using just the international no we have used the detailed uh, cross state urban rural tendulkar poverty lines in our study okay so anybody who says that oh you're just using international that is just not correct now so why go over to three? So our study uh, shows that we were in 2019, we were down to about 17, 18% of that level, right? And so as soon as the pandemic is over, we are likely to be back to that. So it's a better way, right? So of measuring further progress, because if you keep using the absolute poverty, you're not really measuring progress. I mean, if you go from, uh, let's say, 2 to 1.5, what does that tell you? It doesn't tell you anything. On the other hand, the objective would should be. Uh, that this 17% should also be brought down to 2% by, let's say, 10 years or 15 years. So it's a really a measure, a way to keep ourselves in our toes and measure how effectively our growth processes, inclusive growth, etc., is working. Right, sir. So if I can come, come back to you on the cash transfer bit that you mentioned and uh, saying that, you know, that is the most effective. Now, we uh, currently, if you look at our architecture, there are multiple schemes which are there, you know, uh, uh, state center, different schemes, you know, different, uh, there is a cash transfer also, which is there, there is a food uh, scheme, which is there. So uh, is there time, is it, is it time that, you know, India looks at, you know, uh, an income transfer, a universal income transfer, or even, you know, just a basic income transfer scheme? Right. So uh, there are two or three points which come from that. First, you're absolutely right. There are multiple schemes across the country. And uh, again, to put it in historical perspective, you know, India was the first country to uh, start something called poverty alleviation in the 1960s. So we've had tons of these poverty alleviation schemes. And certainly, you're absolutely right. When absolute poverty is eliminated and we move on to this new measure, it's time to rethink that whole uh, structure, in fact. Uh, just another uh, little fact uh, that you said multiple of seen. The last time, which is now pretty long ago when I was in government, I measured there were something like 250 different central and, and state schemes. And I remember arguing with people that the, the district collector he cannot even focus on like three, four, five, ten schemes. He's in charge of all two fifty schemes in the district. True, absolutely, absolutely. Easy. I mean, I'm yeah. sorry for the strong words, but the bookkeeping is solution. The solution is what I have suggested. Yeah, I'm going to answer your question. It's something which I've called a welfare stack. Okay, which is a three level thing. One is a uh, is a uh, internet based, uh, just a, a portal which has all the state and central government schemes for which, you know, let's say the bottom 50% or the bottom 75% of the population is eligible for, okay? So that, that is the first. The, the, the second part of it is exactly this mobile-based uh, 
Aadhaar connected uh, system. And then there are other elements of it. Again, we may not have time to go into those, but I 100% I agree with you that I think now we must seriously think. There are also other variations, for example, but this would come subsequently once you uh, reform the system and integrated all these different schemes uh, into a single scheme. You know, we already have that Pharma 7000, all these could be integrated into a single uh, cash transfer which has different attributes. Single doesn't mean everybody gets the same. You can feed in if you really want to give a differential, let's say to SCSTs, but that could all be in the formula. And once you have Aadhaar connectivity, it's simple, you know. So uh, let's say I'm SCST and somebody is some uh, other cost, uh, I could get 10% more cash transfer. There, there's no problem with that. So, so this, uh, it's definitely uh, now time to start thinking of this uh, reform of the welfare system. Uh, in your paper, you know, there is, uh, there is a commentary on the social safety architecture, you know, how it has helped uh, sort of withstand the income shock. Uh, now, uh, there has been criticism, some criticism from some quarters about, you know, uh, social safety in, uh, architecture, you know, it, it is, it has been found wanting. So, uh, what kind of changes do you think we really need in this architecture? And so, do, you, do you see a need for a change? So, uh, you know, when we, uh, so, so uh, let me go three. There, there are three uh, points I would like to make. First, we must always remember that there is enough evidence from across the world uh, in India that inclusive growth, growth, uh, the faster the growth is, the more quickly you are going to develop, everybody is going to develop. And then we add the inclusive, and I will just explain what that means to me. So fast inclusive growth has to be the primary objective. And, you know, in various places, one has discussed what are the policies needed, et cetera. Again, if necessary, one can talk about those. But the second and third part is the follow. The, the third part is also we have vaguely discussed that the cash transfer uh, welfare stack, which will integrate the transfers to people, the welfare. The middle part is very, very important. It is what, oh, I, I don't know, 30 years ago, I called public and quasi-public goods. Again, I was talking as an economist, but for simple uh, public, you can think of it as public goods. So we have hard infrastructure, we have soft infrastructure. People forget that uh, it's not now, but for 50 or 70 years, we've had a public health system from primary health centers, secondary health centers to uh, tertiary health centers. We have had a, a schooling system, which is both these are virtually free. You know, we've at a primary school level, health level. So that is the quasi public good, which I call. So clearly these remain important. It's very important to improve the quality of this infrastructure. There is a huge focus on hard infrastructure. A lot of been discussed and we not go into it, but the same uh, needs to be done of this. And here, just my personal experience in 2005, six, uh, 2006, it was, I think that then deputy chairman asked me to do a review of the entire social sectors. And uh, believe me, I came to the conclusion that we have tried everything except one thing. Okay, none of that stuff has worked. So I came to this radical conclusion, which I don't know if anybody read it or, or, or took it further at that time, was that the only way is to use modern technology, internet, okay? The doctor, the nurse don't show up at the primary health center half the time, 30% of the time. If you had internet, you can sit in uh, the capital city or the district center and provide education. If the, the school teacher doesn't show up. So same way, health, everything which doesn't require physical intervention, which is surgery, everything can be done on the internet. Currently, and again, there are studies, again, I don't want to take up too much time, some horrifying studies of how local people, you know, we can sit here and talk about public supply, etc. But local people, there was an actual study that they go to quacks. And 90% of that is totally useless. It's a, just a complete waste of money. Now, just think, instead of that, if you could have an internet and a center there, 
where uh, people could, and there could be an intermediary. I'm not saying eliminate all intermediaries, but if even the intermediary was honest, he could look up on the internet, talk to them, and prescribe something by uh, going over the internet. So uh, to, to summarize, my conclusion was in a 1.4 billion uh, population, there was no other way to get India's quality of education, health, and other social service anywhere near that of upper income, middle income or higher income, except to use this e-health, e-medicine, and e-learning systems. I strongly believe in that. I believe the message has gone through to the uh, government, and I think the last budget, budget uh, gave some indication that they are listening. Definitely. Uh, even like during the pandemic, uh, the health expense, the health spending, uh, did it was uh, there were multiple reports which sort of showed that you know they had, uh, you know they had uh, deepened the inequality uh, to that extent. So uh, in your paper, uh, you have, did you actually take the, you know, impact of the health expenditures uh, also? And so, how that impacted get, during the pandemic years? Please. Let's get to the pandemic. Again, it's very important, you know, that there is too much confusion. You asked me about all kinds of studies. There are three issues of inequality, and especially in the pandemic. There is a change in wealth distribution, change in income distribution, and change in consumption. In the thing I have read on media, there is no distinction. Everybody mixes up whatever he wants. And some of them even mix up long-term trends with what happens in pandemic and vice versa. So one has to be very careful as a long-term academic. I mean, essence of good analysis and policies, you must be very clear what we are talking about. So just for uh, your general reader, the, the things which vary the least is generally consumption. So let me give you a scenario of what happened in the pandemic. Again, I don't have all the details, but I have a lot of little connected data. So what happened in, in the lockdown was, and, and the, the, during the two episodes of pandemic, what happens is that uh, the, the income distribution, actually there is no evidence, and I can discuss with you what evidence I have that it actually may have improved, but the, but the wealth was, was a problem. So part of it was that wages, relatively higher wage people actually didn't go to work and didn't get paid, okay? So the distribution actually didn't work, but they had lots of wealth. So they could draw down their wealth and maintain their consumption and maybe increase it even. The poor don't have that option. They used up all their extra savings, whatever they had during maybe the first quarter or two quarters. So they actually uh, probably suffered. I'm waiting for the data. I don't have all the data on the second wave that uh, Q1 of second wave. And as soon as it's there, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. But I don't go on speculation, okay? So whatever it shows. So that is the problem, you know? They, it's not that uh, they, they had less income or there was an imbalance in, in consumption. It's really that this exhaustion of wealth, they could not afford. They've already reached the limit maybe within six months or so of the pandemic. While uh, the richer people, obviously, and the middle class also maybe lasted one year, two year, and use some of that. And clearly, those who were actually affected by COVID were the worst affected. And th those are the people really, which perhaps uh, we were not able to reach that well in terms of compensating them in some way uh, for what they had, you know, including losing their loved ones, etc. So uh, if I were to say that was one weakness in, in our uh, response was that we probably were not able to reach anybody. It's not a question of poor. It's poor, middle class, uh, both uh, taken together. So I think that was, was a bit of a weakness. In terms of policy architecture going forward, we did talk about you know having a comprehensive income support. But uh, we've seen this pandemic, it, it, it sort of has changed the world. So uh, in your view, uh, would we require some kind of special interventions, you know, uh, to give support to people or because you know we've we've seen food transfers helped but going forward should there be some more mechanisms to help you know the other classes you know say for uh, instance middle class so um, a couple of things uh, we've talked about the, the the welfare stack of course that is directed toward let's say 
the bottom half, which already is getting lots of programs, scholarships, etc., which basically is the middle class. So let's be frank. There are all these little little yes. uh, things which uh, the, the middle class also gets, right? So, so one is that is is integrating that itself will make it actually much more, much better and much more efficient. But there is another thing which I have suggested. I mean, uh, we independently, uh, Bala and I suggested independently like 10, 20, 30 years ago, but we also wrote a joint paper. It's something called, uh, I call a net transfer system, uh, which is uh, based on, uh, again, uh, on preserving incentives. So it's a longer term solution. I do not agree with this Western type of system. See, we have long been affected by a problem of corruption and tax evasion. So we have to devise systems which are suitable for our own condition, not just adopt whatever the West uh, suddenly is very a favorite and uh, in fashion. So this net transfer system would build up a welfare part and then basically connect it to the income tax system. So in some sense, everybody would be protected on a similar scale. So just to give you a simple example, the lowest income person would get a minimum amount. Anything he earns over that will be taxed at, let's say, a 10% or eventually 20% rate. So he has a marginal tax, but his income keeps growing. There's an incentive to work. Also, it's protection. If you move back, you automatically get more net income is what it is. That's why it's called a net income transfer system. Okay. So th there are systems which can be designed. I have We have proposed uh, some. Uh, but I think I go back to your suggestion. I think really we need a debate. You know, I'm, I, it may be that the government and others decide that this is not workable. Okay, the one we have proposed. But you are absolutely 100% right that we must start a debate on these things looking forward into the future. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Vermani, for joining us and taking out uh, time for this uh, special uh, session. Thank you so Please. much. Thank you so much for joining us and keep stay tuned to ET India Inc. boardroom.